1992. And uh, as a kid, I used to go to my grandparents very often, and my grandmother would tell me stories about one of our ancestors who was hanged as a witch, Mary Esty. Okay. Uh, she was a sister of Rebecca Nurse, more well-known of the witchcraft victims. And uh, I used to look at a book uh, in their small library, which was a early 20th century books called Salem Witchcraft by a fellow by the name of Nevins. Okay. And that just got me very interested in the subject, and I've been with it uh, since almost uh, an adolescent. Wow. Um, well, let's start with a basic question then. What was a witch in 1692 Salem? Uh, according to the English... Uh, a witch was, and this was the same with most of Europe at the time, a witch was a person who had made a covenant, a mm -hmm. pact with the devil, whereby they would gain uh, knowledge, power, uh, and be able to do things or change things that were typically unnatural. And for that, uh, the devil gave them this power, and they were going to serve him. Uh, they often were given imps or familiars, right. which were unseeable uh, things that would do evil to people, uh, and they would have to suckle energy from the witch. Mm -hmm. And that's why in many of the witchcraft cases, they're always looking for what are called witch marks or witch tits, mm -hmm. uh, that the imps would be able to suck uh, energy from the witch itself. Right. And... A witch was a diabolical thing, according to the uh, uh, people of the time. Uh, we're not talking about Wiccan history and the, the, the witches who tend to be around this country uh, today. Right. Uh, this was a diabolical thing in which they worshipped and tried to do the devil's call. Mm -hmm. And usually took the form of afflicting the the large air quote, good Christians of the area, right? Yes, and in Salem Village in 1692, uh, when they discovered that witches were about, the whole purpose of it was to bring down the Puritan Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Right. Uh, they looked at themselves as being the elect of God, the, the new Israelites of old, mm -hmm. uh, who were establishing a city upon the hill. And the devil obviously would want to combat that type of thing. And that's why they believe that the devil was uh, uh, coming to Salem Village and to all of Mass Bay uh, yeah. to uh, bring God's kingdom on earth down. Well, you know, you mentioned Mass Bay and, and this the start of this, call it a colony, but it was a lot of shots fired of groups of people coming over. We, we talked before we started recording about Endicott and, and uh, Conan's uh, and how they brought people with them and it was more of a business venture. But can you describe the way that the Puritan faith shaped life in the New England colonies? Well, the Puritans were a sect uh, in Old England which believed uh, that the Church of England was still too Catholic. Uh, and what they wanted to do was purify, that's the word Puritan, Puritan yeah. uh, the religion so that it didn't smack of uh, papistry or, or Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to live in England. They were abused, uh, not significantly, but uh, somewhat. Uh, a number of them eventually decided to go to the New World. Mm -hmm. um, they latched on to an economic device of the Mass Bay Colony, and uh, once they got here, they, for a good generation or two, were pretty much independent to do what they wanted. And mm. they looked upon themselves as, uh, uh, John Winthrop would later say, um, establishing a new kingdom upon the hill. And the first Puritans in Old England and New England were very staunch believers. Uh, as they came to the New World and kind of... Um, established themselves, and as they got a little more comfortable, they backslid a, a, a bit. But the first uh, uh, Puritans, John Endicott being one of them, mm -hmm. were very staunch in their beliefs mm -hmm. and uh, did not countenance um, uh, outside agitators coming in. They persecuted the Quakers for a period of time until the uh, home government said, you can't do that. Uh, they didn't like Catholics. They didn't like really any other uh, people coming 
coming in here because they believe that they knew the truth and they didn't want to uh, uh, have it uh, uh, become watered down by uh, other people. So they weren't true uh, Democrats. They were people who uh, uh, believed that they wanted to establish and continue uh, their beliefs. Well, it sounds like they they came in early with an amount of power and autonomy being thousands of miles from England um, and held on to that power. What did power look like in colonial New England um, and who had access to that power? Well, uh, the popular belief is that um, uh, the Puritans uh, were uh, controlled by the clergy. But that's really not the case, Mm -hmm. Um, especially during the witchcraft. We find that with a few exceptions, and the exceptions of people who are ministers within the communities that are being affected by witchcraft, Mm -hmm. most of the others, including the very famous Mather family and other uh, theologians who lived in the Boston area, uh, tried to stem the tide of witchcraft, saying, hold on, we've got to make sure we're not making any mistakes. It was the civil authorities, and uh, Massachusetts was a uh, civil established uh, government. Uh, And uh, generally, the uh, government tended to be looking for witches much more so uh, than the clergy. Why do you think that was? Uh, Probably because... If you look at the original transcripts, and the wonderful thing about Salem witchcraft is Mm -hmm. that um, it's a relatively minor event in world history. Sure. Um, And if you go to England or the continent, hundreds, if not thousands of people were affected by it year in and year out. Absolutely. And uh, the numbers are so much more dramatic than what happened in Salem Village. Mm -hmm. But the thing about Salem Village is Puritans kept good records. And what we can do is we can read what one of the um, uh, accused witches is saying uh, during the civil uh, process against them. Uh, You can hear um, one of my favorite witches is George Jacobs. And George Jacobs, when confronted uh, at his examination, eventually, after being badgered and badgered, said, well, burn me or hang me, but I'll stand in the truth of Christ. I know nothing of witchcraft. Uh, So we can read what these people said, you know, 400 years ago. And in some cases, you can barely read it because it's they didn't know uh, good English. They didn't know how to spell properly. And some of the petitions or depositions done by common yeoman farmers mm-hmm. uh, are very revealing and also revealing in how they actually spoke. So we have something in the uh, the way of about 900 documents that survive uh, that include every aspect of the legal procedures. Uh, and because of this, it's become very attractive to historians mm-hmm. because here you have real good primary source material that you can use, and you have so many wonderful quotes in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those who recorded were not people who were sympathetic to the accused witches. No. Reverend Samuel Paris was asked to, in court, write down some of the testimony. And although a lot of people say, oh, Paris is so much uh, involved in this, and how could you have someone like him or Thomas Putnam, the father of the chief witchcraft accuser, writing depositions, uh, they indicated uh, often that um, I'm trying to, I'm paraphrasing, I'm trying to record exactly as was was said, not being prejudicial to any side. Right. So you do get these heroic... uh, uh, um, quotes that that people back at that time uh, gave, mm-hmm. and you can kind of see at least a little reveal of the psyche of some of the people and what was going on. Yeah. And in, and in what's not said as well. Right. In places where the records seem to go silent, there's something being said there as well. Maybe yep. it's become too overwhelming, there's too much commotion in the room, or you know, I don't feel like writing this sentence down, you know? That's a possibility too. And we do know that... Uh, probably hundreds of other documents uh, have disappeared. Sure. Once in a while, um, we find some of the documents. Often they're uh, in, uh, we've just not looked 
hard enough within the traditional sources right. that they're located there. Other times, something pops up that uh, became an archival astray centuries ago, right. and it comes back in. So, um, Do those pop up locally? Sometimes locally, sometimes they're in collections that people had. Uh, when the witchcraft was over, many of these documents got scattered. Yeah. Uh, and later historians, uh, there was a governor of Massachusetts uh, during the pre-revolutionary uh, period, uh, Thomas uh, Hutchinson, who wrote a history of Massachusetts. Okay. And he actually was given a whole bunch of these very important documents. And Hutchinson was a Tory. And during the Stamp Act crisis of 1765, when the American uh, provincials were mad at England, they attacked his house and they scattered all of his papers uh, outside on the ground and so forth. So a lot of these papers went missing because of the riots of yeah. 1765. Wow. It's a puzzle. Yeah. I'm still finding pieces. I like that. Um, we talk sometimes about the Salem trials as an example of women's and girls' voices breaking into the historical record. Um, women and girls played big roles in the crisis. If, as we dip into the, the whole story, we see that over and over again, uh, both as accusers and as accused. You know, mm -hmm. they're on both sides of the argument or the event. Even so, all of the judges were men. And, and when the trials are ended, men retake the center stage. Life goes on and it's men at the center again. Can you... Maybe describe some of the gender dynamics of this crisis. Sure. Um, in the 17th century, um, the world was made up of males who dominated and then the women folk. Yeah. It is true, however, that when you can see once in a while in not only witchcraft but other documents that women ruled the household, whether or not they were supposedly um, in charge or not. Right. And you can see that there are some remarkable women, especially during the witchcraft. You see some of these women aren't going to take anything from the, from the magistrates. Right. Um, but it was a male-dominated uh, society. And also it was uh, a society in which children were seen and not heard. Yeah. Uh, and the witchcraft changed a lot of this. The witchcraft, the dynamics of Salem uh, witchcraft was such that for one of the first times in history, uh, you had not just the usual suspects of witchcraft uh, accused. Mm -hmm. These were usually women mm -hmm. uh, of a lower uh, social status uh, who had some kind of problems with them. Well, we started having accused full-fledged church members. Right. Rebecca Nurse, uh, who belonged to the Salem Church, and um, uh, uh, Mary... Uh, uh, Martha Corey, mm -hmm. who belonged to the Salem Village Church. And in those days, what a covenant member meant was not that you were just a little bit better, but it meant that population of Salem Village was about 550 people. Mm -hmm. Of that 550, about 45 to 50 of them were full church members in 1692. Mm. They were people who had been given a sign by God, which the other church members acknowledged that they were one of the elect, that right. they were going to make it. They passed and, the test. Yes. And they were the only ones who could participate in communion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a high status. So as soon as the first uh, woman who was a full-fledged church member was accused, that got everyone very nervous. Yes. Because if you could have this person who's supposed to be one of the elect actually being yeah. a witch, that meant your whole social order was, was disrupted. Absolutely. Also, you were having small children accused. Uh, Sarah Good, who would have been one of the usual suspects, right. her child, who was, we think, somewhere between four and five, was also accused. Then you get, as time goes on, not just the usual suspects and other women, but men begin to be accused. And it's not unusual to have a man accused, say, in Old England or New England earlier. Sure. But in this case, you get a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. You get a minister accused. You get probably the second or third most um, rich person in all of Massachusetts accused, uh, Philip English, 
Uh, they usually have something about them that makes them a little bit different because Philip English's actual name was Philippe Anglais, uh, and he was a... Um, a descendant of the Channel Islands, the Frenchified Channel Islands. Okay. So uh, he was an outsider. Yeah, uh, you have uh, John Alden, the grandson mm -hmm. of John and Priscilla, accused. Um, so it became a little more democratic in who could be accused. Yeah. Uh, and near the end of the witchcraft, there was talk. It never went to anything legal, but there was talk that the governor's wife uh, might be uh, one. So in one sense, it's kind of interesting in that Salem witchcraft was a little more democratic. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, women were the usual suspects, and it was mm -hmm. typically uh, a woman who was lower class who maybe had a better uh, status early in life and just um, had come down from it. Yeah. When we talk about examinations and trials and people in power, um, obviously what they're looking for is some, I guess, some justice in all of this, looking for a, a legal and a spiritual solution to a problem that's threatening them. How, how would you describe the Puritan sense of justice and injustice? What uh, what would it mean for a New England Puritan to seek justice from the law? Uh, Puritans believe very firmly in the establishment of law. Mm -hmm. And early on, they had statutes. Uh, every year, uh, the uh, general court, which was the colonial legislature, would um, promulgate all sorts of acts and so forth. Uh, the Puritans were also very litigious. Mm -hmm. uh, they were always suing each other for land or something like that. Uh, they were in the best traditions of old England, and uh, we tend to think now, looking at things with the 21st uh, century outlook, that, oh, these were kangaroo courts, and, you know, they, they didn't have any justice. Well, they wanted to have justice, but it was justice the way they thought in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. Lawyers were basically unknown. Um, they didn't trust lawyers. And um, the judges were supposed to be people who would be able to look at both sides and be uh, judicious in uh, their uh, use of, of both sides as well. The Salem witchcraft trials went through classic uh, English um, jurisprudence. Um, Unfortunately, it was stacked a bit, and many other factors were involved that made it um, uh, look uh, very open and shut kind of cases. But um, if 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 I can, let me just go through the procedures. Uh, it might be a little long, but you can cut what you want. Um, Someone is looked upon as being suspicious of practicing witchcraft. Some of the young girls are saying, this person has come to me, his uh, spirit is uh, afflicting us. Uh, and an adult will go to a local magistrate and file a, a complaint. And the magistrates will have a preliminary hearing. Uh, one of the problems with this whole Salem thing is right now in 1692 until May, we didn't have a sitting governor. Uh, the whole colonial system uh, uh, of the legislature and so forth was kind of on hold until the new governor could come from England. And no charter either, correct? Right. That had yep. been revoked. Yes. And they were working on a new sort of global charter for the larger colony as a whole. Right. Uh, and of course, these are factors that um, make a community not too sure of what's going on. Yeah. So there were a lot of, you know, in, in plane accidents and so forth, there's always a whole bunch of things that came together uh, in exquisite format that just made something bad happen. Yeah. And if any of those things were not quite the case, things could have changed. And it was the same in 1692. Mm -hmm. So what they do is there's an accusation of witchcraft. So the local magistrates take a listen mm -hmm. and depositions are made and they take a look at the uh, accused witch and ask them questions. Uh, these weren't uh, legal eagles. They were just... Um, uh, men who were in business and had some knowledge, maybe read some law books and so forth. Uh, and they had to determine whether or not the person accused uh, 
uh, had enough going uh, for them so that they should be held. Mm -hmm. And in almost every case, they decide, yes, they should be held. So they're thrown in jail awaiting for the civil government to formulate. Uh, by May, the new governor, William Phipps, comes together uh, with a lot of the learned people in Massachusetts and establishes a court of oyer and termina to hear and determine these cases because now the jails are being clogged by a number of people who have been accused and at the preliminary hearing they've just been put in jail. Uh, so what they then do is have just the same legal system that's done in old England, mm. and, and that is um, you have a grand jury that listens to the attorney general of Massachusetts give the case, and, you know, they always say you can indict a ham sandwich. Well, you could back at that time, too. Uh, almost everyone always in, is indicted, and the indictments often are from two or three or four different people. Once in a while, the indictment doesn't go. At least one of the accused, one of the afflicted children, um, they, they don't believe. So there was a little bit of looking at this um, uh, with, with some modicum of, of uh, legalese. Uh, but generally, everyone who's held uh, is indicted. Mm -hmm. Then you have the trial. You have uh, a pool of jurors from among the towns in Massachusetts who will be the jury. You have this um, eight or nine person um, special court, court of lawyer and termina, uh, who will be the judges. And they uh, are supposed to have, I think, at least three or four of these magistrates there. Uh, and they can ask questions and can kind of mold what they want to have happen. But it's basically the attorney general who gives the information. If you're accused, you have the right of um, saying, I, I don't like this juror. Uh, you also have the right of bringing in testimony, evidence, people. But if you're a farmer or if you're a farmer's wife who's never been before a magistrate before, uh, even though you might know what you can and cannot do, they're relying on the judges and they really don't know how to do things quite as well. The same thing happens in old England as well. Uh, so then you have the trial, and trials are very fast. Usually within two days, maybe three, all of the evidence is in. The jury goes out, makes its determination, and in almost every case, uh, the people are found guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, you, have a, you have a period between um, when they're found guilty and when the execution will happen because thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. A witchcraft is a... Um, uh, a, a, a hanging offense. Uh, and um, at that time, you have some period of being able to contact the governor trying to do a stay or whatever. Mm -hmm. Hardly ever happens. And within a certain period of time, uh, the people are hanged. Uh, they weren't burned. Uh, right. No Englishman was ever burned for the crime of witchcraft because witchcraft in English law is a, um, uh, is a felony. And felons are hanged. On the continent, witchcraft is a heresy against the church, and heretics are burned. So burnings took place on the continent, but not in England or, mm -hmm. or America. There's an exception. Matthew Hopkins, the witchfinder general during the English Civil War, in his year and a half of activity, uh, tried and executed, and those are loose terms, um, about 150 to 200 witches. One of them was a woman who had been accused of killing her husband in addition to witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Killing your husband at that time was an act of treason. He was seen as the head of the household. And so she was actually burned. Um, but she was burned for her treason, right. not her witchcraft. Right. And But it is a common misconception. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't say that these were kangaroo courts. Sure. They happened very quickly, and um, the judges didn't— here, we, we don't have a lot of information from the trials themselves. Most of what we read about 
the witchcraft, quote, trials are actually from the preliminary hearings in which there's give and take, the uh, magistrates ask questions and the accused answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, the trial material has disappeared. We don't have it. It's not to say that there would be a huge amount of new information because generally with regular trials, what they do is they do a synopsis of what happens. So mm -hmm. you don't get um, new evidence being introduced. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning before, before all of the witch conflict came into the community here in Salem Village. Why in, in 1666 was Salem Village requesting independence from Salem Town? Uh, and, and why was the town refusing that to them? If you look at a map, uh, Salem Town is right on the coast. Uh, it's a fairly large community. In 1692, they have about 1,500 uh, residents. Uh, it looks more to the commercial ventures, um, uh, to fishing. Um, the people there tend not to be yeoman farmers, uh, but people who have uh, occupations um, uh, besides farming. Mm -hmm. Salem Village, uh, the center of Salem Village is about seven miles from the center of Salem Town. And in the whole history of Salem, uh, Salem started out as a very large, uh, expansive uh, popula uh, of area. Mm -hmm. And what happened was many communities, Beverly broke off in 1664, I think it was. Uh, many communities broke off. The, uh, Salem Village was looked at kind of as the breadbasket for Salem Town. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they like the rates because rates are what you get for like taxes to be able to uh, take care of the community. And there was a reluctance that went for over a hundred years in the part of Salem town to allow Salem village to become independent. Uh, that brought up an awful lot of, um, uh, uh, people not liking that from the village. Uh, if you had to participate in the militia, you would go away from your own homestead, and there was always the the uh, fear of Indian attack or something like that. Uh, you'd have to go five, seven miles to Salem Town to be part of the uh, uh, guard for the evening, and your own uh, homestead, which was completely isolated, uh, was unprotected. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there was a religious part of it. It's a long ways to go, five to seven miles uh, every week, actually twice a week if you want to go to religious services. So there was a real frustration on the part of the Salem villages. They made several petitions to be broken off, as many other communities were, and Salem was always very reluctant uh, to do that. Finally, in 1672, they did acquiesce to have Salem Village have its own uh, meeting house. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a covenant uh, uh, congregation. They still, if they wanted to have communion, would have to go to Salem, but they could hire lay ministers in Salem Village, build a meeting house, which they did, and uh, hear the Word of God um, locally. Uh, and this continued until 1688, when finally Salem uh, ecclesiastically acquiesced and allowed Salem Village to form their own covenant church, and that was the Church of Christ at Salem Village. And they uh, introduced uh, the new minister. They had been several ministers mm -hmm. previous, uh, but this minister was able to do the sacraments. And uh, his name was uh, the Reverend Mr. Samuel Paris. He had not been an ordained minister. Uh, he had, uh, I guess the term today would be he had taken courses, but, uh, you know, wasn't. And... Um, he was a man who had changed his occupation. He was a merchant, didn't do that well there, uh, had a, uh, a belief in uh, uh, wanting to do good, and, and so uh, took the call in Salem Village, mm -hmm. and the village uh, took him on as the minister. Uh, and uh, he was ordained in uh, 1689. But you find that in his coming to Salem Village, you had some problems, and the problems were you always had within your uh, community the covenant members, mm 
usually like 10% of the population, and then the others, the outsiders who had to contribute to the meeting house for the church, um, but didn't really have too much of a say that way. Mm. Uh, they believed, the outsiders believed that the covenant members had given Paris too good a deal, uh, especially since he hadn't been minister anyplace else. He was kind of a, a newbie. And uh, the deal was they gave him the parsonage, which had been built in 1681, as a place that he could live in, and also they gave him the deed to it. And most of the people in the village say, what are you doing that for? You know, this is stuff that we, through our taxes, put together. Uh, he doesn't deserve a parsonage. He deserves, you know, a, a pay. Uh, so that brought the two uh, to somewhat loggerheads. And Paris, I guess by his nature, awfully hard to know what people were like from the prospect of 400 years later. Right. Uh, and, you know, you really can't psychoanalyze anybody. But Paris apparently did believe that now that he was a minister, he deserved what ministers typically got, which was a differ differential respect within the community. And a lot of the villages just never wanted to give him that. Uh, he started having problems with this congregation. Uh, they were supposed to bring to him the cord wood, and you needed about 15 cord of uh, wood a year to be able to survive in a homestead, uh, and they weren't doing it. And um, he had, one of his requests was, before he would agree to be minister, they should bring it to him. And many of them thought, we'll have it, but he's got to get it. Uh, ministers often were also yeoman farmers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it just went badly. Uh, Paris did not get, and he actually preached, um, always talking about this confrontation, trying to show that there shouldn't be any. Uh, and by the time of the witchcraft, um, he wasn't being paid his salary. Uh, he hardly had any wood, and there was a, a, although the covenant members still supported him very, very vigorously, and several of the afflicted children came from the Paris house itself and from the house of other covenant members who lived close by. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of factors that made this kind of a red flag kind of thing. Not to say that there wasn't consternation in other uh, settlements because ministers, although today we would think, oh, the Puritans, they, they had to love their minister and they had to get together. It was always a contention within many communities about the pay of the, the salary of, of the ministers. And there was controversy very often uh, that would last for several years or mm -hmm. whatever. I love that firewood becomes the centerpiece of this conversation a lot. I mean, it was part of his contract negotiations that that, that he had firewood delivered to him. And it it sounds petty. And yes. I think in some ways it represents the pettiness of how they were treating their minister, not paying him and things like that. So one of the early conflicts, again, going back to pre-witchcraft trials, is this Putnam versus Porter rivalry that seems to be taking place. And there are religious issues within it. I think, you know, the fact that You've got that halfway covenant that's, I guess, a little bit more of a leaning, a liberal leaning Puritan faith. Um, and the Porters are on that side of the fence. And then you have the Putnams in Salem Village who are, they were part of those covenant members of the church, if I'm correct. Um, and it's, they, they seem to be fighting a lot about that. They're also two of the wealthiest families in the area. But, but the part that baffles me when I read about it is how when Thomas Putnam Sr. passed away and his will was executed, you know, and the wealth is distributed. It wasn't, it wasn't a Putnam or even an, uh, an independent party who executes that will, but it's Israel Porter. Um, what can you tell us about that, that situation? Uh, first of all, you should understand that the Putnams uh, controlled approximately, I got to remember, uh, I did a study in this in graduate school. They, there were about 12 to 15 percent of the population of Salem Village were Putnams. <laughs> and their associative 
community of others who married into the Putnam family made it so that they were a, the, the largest minority within Salem Village. Mm. They tended to be a bit conservative. They were almost all yeoman farmers, believed in uh, wealth being land. So they were not rich in the fact of uh, money, but in land. Right. And they tended to live in the western part of the village. The western part of the village being farther away from Salem Town than other parts of Salem Village. Yes. Like as far away as you could get, essentially. Right. And yeah. the porters looked more towards the east, towards the coast, towards Salem. You might say they were perhaps a little more sophisticated, or at least they ran around with a population that was uh, more looking to the outward rather than to the inward. The porters were. Yep. And uh, Thomas Putnam, when he died, um, he had married a second time, and the offspring from that was Joseph Putnam. And Joseph Putnam, he was named Joseph because of the biblical Joseph, who uh, was uh, the youngest, and uh, and I would dare say probably the other Putnams were a bit jealous of Joseph because he and his mother inherited the bulk of the property that Thomas had. And in those days, uh, with primogeniture, it was supposed to be the oldest member of the family got most everything, and the others would get basically scraps. Right. Uh, so there was some resentment there. Um, I'm not sure if you can actually say that the Putnams and the Porters were against each other. They did come up uh, in ecclesiastical um, uh uh, affairs as well as um, political affairs, um, they were often on different sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole idea about people trying to gain land, which was a very popular theory in the 19th century that much of the witchcraft stemmed from land grabs, mm -hmm. that's really not probably the case. They were always contentious about land. And if you own something, and if your tree that was supposed to be the, the northeast bound of it went down, uh, there would be real consternation about where the, where the location of the, of the boundary was. Um, but land was just something that every community had problems with, and it wasn't a matter of trying to get land from uh, other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also uh, one of the popular myths uh, in Salem witchcraft is that uh, if you were hanged uh, as a witch, uh, your land would be confiscated. And that is absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the government could take your movable estate, which meant the ring on your finger, uh, the furniture in your house, mm -hmm. uh, a cow that you might have. But the land went with blood. The land went with uh, probate. And you can see that by John Proctor, accused witch ready to be executed in jail, uh, actually gives uh, by legal deed uh, his property to his sons. Mm. And that was proved in probate court and went on. So uh, that's one of the myths in uh, the history of witchcraft. Well, we had talked about this a little bit before we started recording, and I want to get back to it because it's, it's so fascinating. So one of the reasons why... Um, we're here with you in the archives of the Peabody Essex Library here in Danvers uh, is because you have a notebook that people think of it as Samuel Paris's notebook, but, but you were explaining to me that it's actually a, it's a bigger document than Samuel Paris. Tell me a little bit about this notebook. And, sure. Yeah. Uh, we were established back in 1972 as the Danvers Archival Center. And what we wanted to do is bring together all of the printed and written history of the town of Danvers. We got the public records. We got the uh, books of the Peabody Institute Library. Uh, we moved to the library in new uh, 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 quarters. Uh, we also wanted to get records of other organizations in Danvers. And the principal one we wanted to get was the records of the First Church Congregational. That was the original First Church of Christ at Salem Village, the oldest actually the oldest organization in Danvers, hmm. date 1672. And they had several record books. 
and one of them was the minister's record book kept by each minister uh, from 1689, when they became a covenant church, uh, to the present. And this is very historic material, uh, Mm -hmm. and it's really some of the last material that was still in not public hands, not in a library or something. As a matter of fact, back in the uh, late 1960s, uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum, two professors from UMass, uh, in their book, Salem Possessed, I got them into the church to see these records, and they thought they were absolutely fantastic because the records include the witchcraft era, in which Paris um, talks about the excommunication of one of the witches, uh, Martha Mm -hmm. Corey, uh, talks about the beginning of the witchcraft when one of his congregants made a witch cake, unbeknownst to him, and which he believes brought the devil into Salem Village, uh, has a confession of forgiveness by the chief witch accuser, who later on wanted to become a covenant member, Mm. Uh, And all sorts of controversy. Paris, when the witchcraft was over, you had the people who had been hanged. Their families were not really happy with Samuel Paris. They were trying to force him out, and they made life miserable for him. Mm -hmm. And it was brought to synods, to uh, uh, um, organizations to try to rectify what was going on. And there would be petitions and counterpetitions signed by the various farmers. And he records every single one of them. And if you believe in graphology, which is the study of handwriting analysis, Paris has a very readable hand. You can read it in the 21st century, um, whereas most 17th century script is pretty bad. Uh, As he gets more pressured within Salem Village, 1694, 95, 96, his handwriting gets smaller and smaller and more compact, and you can almost feel him being squeezed. So this is really good historic stuff. We were thinking, well, the first church... They've been here since the 1670s. They were a very conservative church. In New England, we had in the early 1800s the um, Unitarian Revolution, in which most first churches in Massachusetts and New England became Unitarian, a much more liberal uh, church, uh, and very few remained congregational. The one in Salem Village remained congregational. Mm. Most of the people living in Salem Village in what then was Danvers Plains, excuse me, let me do that over again. Um, In the 1950s and 60s, most of the people who were the congregation of the first church uh, were people who had lived there for generation upon generation so they could trace their lineage back to the witchcraft times. They were so somewhat conservative and very neighborly in that they had a speech pattern that was only known to around Center Street in Danvers, and that was called the Center Street Twang. Really? Uh, It's almost gone now because interlopers like me moved into the neighborhood (laughs) over the years. Uh, But... You know, we figured this is going to be very hard to get them. New Englanders tend to be very possessive of their stuff, sure. even if they can't take care of them. And we thought the first church was going to be that way as well. Uh, for a number of uh, months uh, and years, uh, we tried to help them with their collections and so forth. And once the establishment of the Archival Center came in 1972, they agreed and were willing to take all of their records and put them on permanent deposit with us. Wow. Uh, it was a real coup, and I have to give it to them. They, they, they were very good about it. We've done well with the materials. We've actually uh, spent a lot of money conserving the mm-hmm. books and papers. And when that happened, it was like the floodgates opened. Yeah. Other churches said, well, if the first church is willing to give it, I guess it's okay. So we now have, with the exception of the Catholic Church, which has its own um, um, uh, archives, sure. uh, we have every Protestant church that either was and became defunct or still functions. Uh, and the first church collection is, is very good and very important. It's amazing. And that, to be able to read Samuel Paris's, uh, I guess, professional complaints and, and documentation of what he's going through, what right. the church is going through in his own handwriting. Um, and you're right. I'm glad it's legible. 
because a lot of that is very illegible. Yes. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why Paris was asked by the uh, magistrates to write down testimony during the witchcraft. And you would think, he is a minister, his family is afflicted by the <laughs> witchcraft, uh, he's trying to root out the witches, and they're asking him to, uh, to do the documentation. But I think he tried to do a good job. Yeah. And at least two of the uh, examinations, he at the end writes, um, much was going on, it was very hard to uh, uh, hear everything, but I tried to put things down as correct as possible uh, so that I wouldn't uh, be uh, uh, guilty of uh, prejudicing uh, either side. Right. That's paraphrasing it, sure. but that's what he said. Yeah. Omission w could be a, an accusation. You know, right. He's editing the, the history of, of the event. Yeah. One of the important families in this whole situation would be the Hawthorne family. And, you know, we talk about uh, the removal of the charter from Massachusetts in the so the 1680s, early 1680s, mm -hmm. and 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 how um, John Hawthorne, the magistrate, his father William was actually one of the key people in establishing some of the laws that were on the books in the colonies and helping to run and govern. He, but he's also known for persecuting Quakers. I think you mentioned that a little a bit ago that um, there was this animosity toward the Quakers, and uh, early on the Puritans didn't treat them so well. Do we know how the family legacy of the Hawthorns influenced um, John the Magistrate's legal stature in the eyes of the Puritans? I mean, you, you have the charter removed. There's no governor. It almost seems that we're in a little bit of a legal chaos for, for a small amount of time. Um, but at the center of the, the examinations and the witch trials, we have a Hawthorne. You know, we, have, we have William's son, John, who comes in. Does this, does this affect the way he's perceived by the community around them? Do they feel some trust in him that... Thank goodness at least John's in charge of this. Uh, two of the most important magistrates in Salem were John Hathorn uh, and Jonathan Corwin. Right. They were both merchants, um, learned people, uh, not lawyers, not professional legal people, uh, but they had a lot of sense. They always were, uh, for years, under whatever the government was, magistrates who would hear cases. Mm -hmm. And they were asked uh, to take a look at what was happening in Salem Village. So they were the initial magistrates who came over to little old Salem Village, March 1st, 1692, they went to the meeting house because um, they had to have uh, enough space because everybody had heard about three people being accused of witchcraft, and it became a real public thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're told that the meeting house was absolutely filled to the gills, and people were outside looking in, uh, trying to find out what was happening. And it was cold. I mean, yes. they had, they'd had a snowstorm just a day or two before. Well, it, it was uh, actually Salem Village, uh, 1692 was a relatively mild year for snow, but it was still a, a cold winter. Right. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's mud season, and uh, it would have been quite a spectacle. You have probably more than the population of Salem Village is there watching wow. what is, you know, the first real witchcraft examination that they've had in years. Mm -hmm. And here it is in Little Salem Village. Uh, Hathorn was um, very specific in that he asked many questions. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Corwin uh, generally took down the evidence that he was hearing and didn't ask a lot of questions, but Hathorn did. And you can see he asks leading questions. How long have you been a witch? <laughs> you know, it's the kind of thing like, uh, when did you stop beating your wife kind of thing. Um, they believed, especially after Tituba, who was Reverend Paris's slave, mm -hmm. probably a Carib Indian, uh, who had come with Paris uh, when he became minister, um, She's confessed. She was the first of 50 people who confessed. And in those days, you know, we still have a hard time. All that we know about psychology today, when someone confesses and later retracts it, and uh, we go, well, you know, why would you confess if you're not, if you if you're not guilty? Why would you confess? Well, people do confess, especially under certain uh, real strains. Uh, and Tichuba gave a real confession. 
there's some possible evidence that she might have been beaten by Paris to quote, tell the truth. Mm. Uh, And she came up with something that instead of calming the witchcraft thing, in in most witchcraft cases, both in England and New England, what you do is you get one, maybe two people accused. Um, They would either be found not guilty or quickly be found guilty and hanged, and that would be the end of it. Here you have three people accused in Salem Village. One is Paris's slave. And imagine how Paris must have thought that the witchcraft begins in his household. Here he's a minister of God. How excruciatingly embarrassing it had to be to him. And I think that's one of the reasons you have to understand that Paris was going to root out this evil because it was happening uh, within his family. Mm-hmm. Um and Tichuba said, uh, well, I, I, a dark man came and told me to afflict the children, which I did. And she kind of accused the other two who said they weren't guilty, but they weren't sure about each other, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tituba indicates that not only uh, are the three of them involved, but there's several others. So instead of tapping it down, it expands it. And when just a few weeks later, actually a few days later, a Covenant Church member is accused, and then a three-year-old girl is accused, and then another Covenant member is accused, and then a man is accused, you suddenly get this explosion Mm -hmm. of witchcraft accusations. And when people start confessing, why would you confess? And uh, Reverend... Um, Hale, John Hale, minister in Beverly, right next to Danvers. Uh, He wrote a book later on about the witchcraft Hmm. called A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft. And anytime you see a book from the 17th century that says a modest inquiry, what he's going to do is bulk the system. He's not going to be one who uh, uh, becomes... um, copacetic with the with the company thoughts, uh, he's going to break out a little bit. And he asked that it not be published until after he died. Hmm. And you might think, boy, this is going to be controversial. It was actually not very controversial, except that he said two things brought the witchcraft forward. One was the believability of the afflicted children. They were doing things that normally you wouldn't see being done. They were profoundly tortured. Puritans weren't stupid. They knew what um, epilepsy was. They knew what St. Elmo's fire is. They knew that kids could be manipulative at times. But this was different. This was something that they had never experienced before. And this brought a profound belief so that sometimes even families of accused witches would say to their accused uh, uh, family, well, you must be guilty because maybe you don't know it, but you have to be guilty because the children say you are. And the other thing um, uh, uh, Hale said was that by having that many people confessing, why would you belie yourself? Uh, Today, we don't think of lies as much of anything. Back in the 17th century, a a lie was a smack at God's face. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you lied for something that had to do with life and death, um, this would not bode well as to where you were going. Uh, And Paris said, by these two means, We walked in the clouds and could not find our way. Mm. So um, in the beginning, before the hysteria, not supposed to use that word so much anymore, but before this uh, irrationalness happened, um, other factors were being combined to allow a normal settlement to go into uh, histrionics. And of course, the we have the examinations, these informal magistrates and the accused, and a, as you said, a, a meeting house packed full of people <laughs> outside as well, peering in the windows. Um, but eventually, the governor, the new governor, Phipps, gets involved, and you mentioned a term earlier, the Oyer and Terminer. Um, how were juries selected 
And this is the part that, I mean, you think about a jury being an, an impartial group that needs to hear all both sides and mm -hmm. make decisions. But this has been running amok for weeks before Phipps gets involved and becomes an Oyer and Terminer trial. So how how did they select the juries for Oyer and Terminer in general and and in Salem in particular? And, and what was the process like for handling this crisis in a new type of court, a more higher court? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the 17th century, um, jury selection is much like it's still practiced uh, today. Um, when you have a court that's going to uh, do a, a number of cases, what you do is you contact the various communities that the court serves, and you ask the board of selectmen to choose jurors. So they'll have a pool of jurors. You always ask for more jurors than you need because mm -hmm. this pool will be brought in uh, to the um, uh, to the courts, uh, and they select them. And the one difference, however, is the selection did not include women, mm -hmm. did not include slaves, obviously, mm -hmm. but also had to include those people who were full fledged church members and who owned property. So you're talking about basically the more conservative within a community. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way it was done throughout. This, uh, Salem witchcraft is not the exception. It's, it's the rule. Mm -hmm. And you would have the pettit jury uh, and the grand jury. And very often, once the trials took place, trials went in clusters— uh, the uh, attorney general uh, of the uh, province would decide, looking at who was accused, what the best cases were. You go for the ones that you think you're going to slam dunk real fast. Uh, and the jurors would be taken from a pool. So it could be a juror from Beverly, from Topsfield, from Boxford or whatever. And they're often used throughout the process. And although there wasn't there doesn't seem to have been manipulation of jurors. Uh, we do know at least one case in which um, the trial of Rebecca Nurse, which was uh, the, uh, one of the more interesting trials, took place. And uh, at trials, what happens is depositions that were filed at the time of the preliminary hearings are given and read as testimony sworn to before court. Uh, these depositions were added to, however, during the legal process. Uh, and it's interesting to see because witchcraft is what's known as an exceptional, excuse me, an exceptional crime. Mm. And it meant that you had to have at least two people witness witchcraft in order to convict because we're talking about a capital case. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by using the preliminary hearing as evidence in which you have more than two people, two of the afflicted girls, giving testimony that the specter, invisible to everyone else, of Rebecca Nurse is torturing them. And uh, they're being choked or they, they have marks on their hand, which they'll show uh, uh, the people there. And that is used as evidence. And... It's added to on the deposition. So depositions are filed. In many cases, uh, people who were friends or relatives of accused also filed depositions, but they could not swear to it. Uh, the big difference was because they didn't want them to be belying themselves. So you couldn't swear to it, which means that their evidence a juror would see was not quite as good as a sworn deposition against someone. And you also had, very often, people who had been confessing witches who were set aside, we'll take care of them later, but they're important because they can be brought before the trial, mm -hmm. and by voice, they can give testimony that so-and-so is one of us. I saw her at a, a witch's Sabbath a few, and that's used as, as uh, prime evidence as well. So, in almost every case, if you're brought up for trial, you're found guilty. Rebecca Nurse was the exception. Uh, at first, the jurors came back with a not guilty 
and it was pandemonium in the courthouse. The afflicted children who were there, and also some older afflicted ones, started going into profound fits and so forth, pandemonium. One of the magistrates asked, and I think it was William Stoughton, he was the chief justice of the uh, of the panel. Uh, he said, um, have you considered uh, some testimony um, of someone who said this or that? And the jurors asked Rebecca Nurse a question. Uh, I accused which a confessed witch had given testimony that she was one of us. And they said to Rebecca, uh, I'm sorry, Rebecca said, why, she is one of us. And she was asked, what did that mean? And she didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. And the jurors took that as being a form of guilt. Mm-hmm. And of course, she couldn't hear. She was uh, almost deaf. Uh, and so they came back a little bit later with uh, with a guilty. Well, Rebecca's interesting, too. She had a, an uncommon situation where community around her attempted to intervene in the legal proceedings. Um, friends and neighbors stepping forward. Yep. Was that a common thing or was that uncommon? It was about in the middle. Okay. Uh, about... Um, of the documents that survive, we have maybe about 20 of them in which either one person, a couple, or a bunch of people would send in a deposition uh, or a petition saying that we've known her all of our life and she never looked like she was uh, a witch or never deported her any any more than a good Christian. Right. Uh, Forty people signed uh, the one to Rebecca Nurse, wow. including a couple Putnams. Uh, and that did give some weight. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, the Nurse family that tended to be a little more... Um, forthcoming uh, rather than just uh, allowing the court to do what they wanted because they didn't know any better. They went to the governor, and he stayed execution for a few days Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, her case is a bit more unusual than the others, and she was the only one who was found not guilty at first. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of those accused... Uh, the minister, uh, Reverend George Burroughs, who had served Salem Village prior to it becoming a full covenant church back in the 1680s. It was he uh, who um, uh, took best advantage of the new parsonage. He moved into what was the new parsonage as an incentive to get him to come to the village. Uh, He was accused, and they really went after him because uh, he was a minister who wasn't the typical minister, hadn't baptized some of his children. He was on the frontier. He seemed more like a Baptist than a, than a real Puritan. Uh, and um, he, uh, he challenged at least one of uh, the people serving on his jury and tried to introduce uh, evidence as well. But um, he didn't do it well, and uh, he was found guilty. And uh, Cotton Mather particularly disliked him because he thought there was such a stain of a minister being in league with the devil. Mm. You mentioned earlier how one of the reasons Governor Phipps stepped in was because the jails were packed, right? Multiple jails were filling up with people who were either being, like you said, held for later, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you again later, or being held for execution or trial. And uh, one of the things that I found interesting in reading about this is some of these jails were not very well constructed. They weren't very secure. Right. Um, and people were escaping. And there were a number of people who actually escaped and went off to build new lives for themselves. Um, when some of the prisoners escaped, it, it seems to me that they would leave no paper trail of escaping, or, or was there a paper trail of that? How do we know about the escapes? Uh, in some cases, um, uh, because warrants were sworn out uh, for them uh, after they had escaped. Not an awful lot of escapes. Very often when they heard they were about to be arrested, they would skedaddle. Uh, a few of them, if you were rich, mm-hmm. you were treated differently and you could take care of yourself much better in jail. Because in jail, you had to pay for your own fees. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to eat, 
there might have been a, a common pot in which you could partake. But if you wanted to eat, often your family brought you the food. They'd bring you fresh straw so that you would have a, a mattress that would have uh, fresh straw in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you wanted a stool so you didn't go on the uh, cold ground all the time. That could be brought in. Uh, people like Philip English, one of the most uh, richest people in the province, and his wife were in jail in Boston, and they were given uh, freedom during the daytime so they could go out and do what mm -hmm. they wanted, mm -hmm. uh, as were a couple others. He went to a Sunday service in which um, Reverend Willard gave a sermon, and his sermon basically said, if you are persecuted, you should flee. And it was a uh, unadulterated uh, message and both of them left. They went to New York until the witchcraft uh, crazies was over and then came back. Uh, a few others uh, escaped. Mm -hmm. The majority of them, however, were required to stay in jail. And after a period of time, uh, when it looked like the apparitions, the specters, of the witches, even in jail, were hurting people. For some reason, they thought if they were put in shackles and chains, this would prevent the specter from getting away. So many of them then were, were put in chains uh, wow. for the duration. Wow. So you've mentioned the Mather family a couple of times. Uh, ministers around Massachusetts, or the, the colony of Massachusetts, read Mather's book uh, from the pulpit as as if it was doctrine. Um, and, and Brattle circulates a, a critical letter. Um, how common was it for the Massachusetts ministers to coordinate this kind of deeply political messaging? Very often, the civil magistrates would ask the opinion of the learned ministers on something that had to do with spiritualism or good contact or that sort of thing. And after the execution of Bridget Bishop, who was the first uh, uh, accused, uh, convicted witch to hang, and that was, in, I think, June 10th, 1692, there was a lot of um, uh, people not happy about what would, what had happened and if they had done everything properly. So they asked the uh, ministers if they would comment about it. And one of the comments that came from that was that um, better 10 guilty go free than one innocent be executed. Mm -hmm. They were basically saying, take it easy, you've mm -hmm. got to use restraint on what you're doing because this is a capital case. Um, the magistrates, the ones who were there every day and saw all these things, really wanted to proceed. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the chief magistrate, uh, William Stoughton, was absolutely sure that witchcraft was a brew and wanted to root it out as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Even after most of the others had kind of thought, at least, oh, we've made some mistakes. If not, we've made terrible mistakes. Uh, Stoughton was still pretty sure that uh, he had got a bunch of the witches and wanted to get more. Yeah. But it did turn over a period of time. It, it took, it was about eight months from the first examination uh, to the last execution. And in that time, a lot of uh, minds had been changed. Thomas Brattle, who really tells us the workings of the court from some of his um, writings, uh, if not changes, he, he did see the, the light on the other side. Mm -hmm. Increase Mather, who is the father of cotton, probably the most learned of the uh, residents of New England at the time, uh, he had written a book, Remarkable, Remarkable Providences, in which he had told back uh, in the 1680s of all the witchcraft cases that had happened. And people used his book as uh, good evidence and uh, a way of proceeding on the cases. As he continued to see what was happening, he eventually wrote a book called, it was a pamphlet called Cases of Conscience. And that 
was circulated uh, in manuscript to ministers, to magistrates, and was the thing that really kind of moved things to being extremely cautious. Mm -hmm. And it's usually looked upon as being one of the things that uh, kind of stopped the witchcraft. Uh, He had a problem with the idea of spectral evidence. How can the person accusing someone else be the only person who sees the evidence that would help hang that person. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, so things changed slowly, but those always in the thick of things um, didn't have that distance mm-hmm. to be able to see things a little more clearly. Right. You talk about the sentiment changing over those eight months and the the minds being changed little by little and eventually increase publishing this pamphlet that really helps people see more. I feel like it's a little bit more logically that they're seeing things. Um, But when it's all said and done, Governor Phipps bans the publication of writing and, and, and publishing about these trials. How common was this sort of attempt at I don't know, silencing current events. I mean, was it common at all, or was this very unique in in that time period? You know, I'm not positive. Um, my inclination is that it happened on occasion when something was very controversial and was, was having a life of its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he did it because contrary publications were coming out, and it wasn't adding light to the events. It was just uh, helping to muddy everything. Right. And um, so that was kind of put as a caution, although things still happen. Uh, many of the printers pretended they were printers in Philadelphia or whatever and still published their stuff, but with a Philadelphia rather than a Boston imprint. And in old England, uh, a number of uh, things were being published. Cotton Mather wrote... Um, Wonders of the Invisible World. Uh, he's looked upon today as being the bad guy in all of this. And I think he's just had a real bad press uh, since the 17th century. He was more of a cautionary person, but was sure that there were witches. And the governor asked if he would write a narrative of what had happened. And sure, he wanted to show that the government had done the right thing. They always believed that the people... Uh, in power were not doing things capriciously, that they were trying to do the right thing. It's just that the information they had was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Um, So what Mather did was he took the best cases, the ones that he thought, gotcha, you're a witch, and and recorded those and didn't record the other ones. Right. And then a guy in Boston whose name, he was a merchant, uh, his name was Robert Califf. Uh, he wrote a book um, actually at the end of the witchcraft controversy. And one of the things that made uh, Phipps say that's it for publications, more wonders of the invisible world. And he tried to show that the Mathers were manipulating things. Mm. He gave us some evidence that we would not have known about um, that was kind of contrary to what supposedly was happening and was much more sympathetic to uh, the witchcraft victims. Uh, Hale, uh, in 1697, comes out with this uh, manuscript. Um, It's published uh, the, the, the chapter specifically on witchcraft trials is published uh, in Cotton Mather's Magnelli Christi Americana, uh, but the full book isn't published until um, uh, the late 17th century. And that now is the rarest of the, the witchcraft volumes. And hmm. it's one in which he's trying to say that we you know, we made mistakes, and primarily the mistakes where we used English precedents rather than the Bible to discover witches. Hmm. That's an interesting take on it. And and he was the one who started from 1700 to the present. Every generation comes up with their new books of theories and why it happened. And, right. And it always has... You know, it has it has what historians drool over. Uh, one, it has great primary sources that you can use a number of different ways. Two, it's a uh, you know kind of uh, intriguing aspect of history in which you've got the devil and all that kind of thing. Uh, and it's still a whodunit, right? 
And whodunits in history always bring the books forward. Um, Sometimes it gets a little boring and nobody talks about it, but we're in a period that's lasted now for 30 years in which a major book comes out every year. You mm-hmm. mentioned Stacy Schiff, who did what I think is one of the best books on Salem witchcraft because mm-hmm. she takes not just the usual victims that everybody writes about, but she tries to incorporate the entire history of the witchcraft, what happened in Andover, which was a major uh, aspect of the, the witchcraft uh, delusion. And... Um, other books uh, from about the 1970s on mm-hmm. come out, and they're always trying to give the definitive theory. Yeah. And if you look at the books and if you take a look at historiography of the witchcraft, books often reflect as much of the culture in which they are written as they do about the historic facts. Mm-hmm. Uh, you come up with theories that are now pregnant within our own society and uh, have an explanation for it based on what we see and, and is observable in, uh, uh, in 18th, 19th, 20th century America. Being in the area... I live in the Danvers, Salem area. So this is all (laughs) sort of my backyard, like it is for you. Um, There's a place in Salem today called Gallows Hill. It's a big, open, grassy hill with a park, and there's a playground and things like that. But that's not Gallows Hill, is it? Or is this a controversy? Um, It's not so much a controversy. When I was growing up, uh, from from the 19th century on, yeah. Gallows Hill is a drumlin. It's one of the New England drumlins that were created when the ice uh, flows went back. And uh, you go to the top of uh, Gallows Hill, which I did as a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a little um, playground there. And when I was very young, they used to show a stump that had been burned. And that was supposedly the tree that they used to hang the victims on. And that was the popular tradition yeah. that they went in a cart with the people condemned and went all the way up to the top uh, and then hanged them on a tree. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you go that far up? It would be very hard to get to and so forth. Um, Although a lot of primary source materials come down to us, Things that have to do with the executions, the gory part of it, mm-hmm. generally don't tend to. Right. Uh, we do have uh, the record that um, Robert Califf did talking about the executions. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned that after they were executed, a number of the bodies were taken to crevices near the place of execution, thrown in there, and very uh, frivolously uh, uh, covered over, although you could see a hand sticking up or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And in the 1790s, there's a record of um, finding some bodies up there, but they were in shrouds. And it's always been kind of a a nebulous thing of what was going on. Uh, A very good researcher back in the late 19th century uh, and then uh, did a couple articles in the early 20th century, his name was Sidney Purley. And he was a great historian. uh, And he came up with the belief that the execution place was actually at the bottom of the hill. Uh, near Proctor Street Mm -hmm. in Salem, right on the Salem uh, Peabody border today. Uh, And he took pictures of the crevices that he thought they would have been thrown into and came up with a a, a very good, uh, uh, believable story, Mm -hmm. Uh, used one piece of evidence that showed... uh, Uh, Someone was in a house at the time of execution, and from their house, they could see the the, the gallows of the bodies hanging. Um, Then a few years ago, um, there was some interest in seeing if they could find where this was located. And a group, um, uh, including a cinematographer, um, professor from Salem State, and a few others, um, got together and came up with an area that was still public land um, behind, uh, I think it's a CVS. uh, Walgreens. Walgreens, okay. And they 
pretty much confirmed, and a woman by the name of Marilyn Roach, a nice uh, researcher, does exquisite work. She found another couple little pieces of evidence that seemed to relate to there. They did um, um, uh, uh, underground scanning and some other stuff. Didn't really come up with any evidence there, but they basically confirmed uh, using modern day mapping and so forth, that this was the area that Pearlie had talked about. And to them, it was probably the most logical place. Um, like some things that happen in life, um, it just exploded. Uh, and everybody around the world um, uh, who was interested saw this story about discovering where the victims were uh, executed. And then the city of uh, Salem decided uh, to put um, a little uh, memorial there. It's a very tasteful one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm out of the memorial business now. I think we have memorialized the Salem witches more than ever. In 1992, we made a major memorial in Danvers, right across the street from where the original meeting house was located. Um, Salem did a wonderful memorial uh, next to the Charter Street burial ground. Uh, Middleton, Topsfield, um, Rowley also did memorials. Uh, and now we have a second one in Salem. So um, I've said, you know, that's enough memorials. Uh, <laughs> but they did it. And um, last summer, I think it was, uh, I went to the, uh, to the dedication there. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's probably a logical place for it to be. I still have a problem with some of the uh, researches in the mode of execution, Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a real minor thing, but what historians always like to talk about. Um, uh, for years, I've been involved in witchcraft studies, and I, I uh, was historical consultant to a PBS American Playhouse movie back in the 1980s called Three Sovereigns for Sarah. It starred Vanessa Redgrave, and it had to do with uh, my ancestor's sister, Sarah Cloyce, who survived, and uh, Mary Esty and Rebecca Nurse, all three of them being sisters. Mm -hmm. And um, I really love the program. I had a lot to do with how it looks. They gave me that. Um, it, it wasn't a commercial thing, so we used public money. So mm -hmm. uh, the historian Steve Nissenbaum and I were the consultants. Um, the one thing I think I did a major mistake was having it as the hanging tree. We found a tree. We had to look all over Essex County to find one. And we finally found one fairly big in, um, in uh, Hamilton. Uh, and we did the thing there. And I was saying, this is very awkward to do. And then I did research on the method of hanging in the 17th century, England and New England. All of the uh, prints that come out show a gallows, and it's a very simple gallows. Uh, I believe that the one used in Salem was two upright posts and a horizontal beam, uh, nicely chamfered so that it was smooth. It didn't look natural. Puritans didn't. Puritans always had to manipulate nature. They didn't believe. Uh, that uh, that humans should use natural things in their own state because what good are humans if they can't manipulate nature? Um, and what you do is you'd put a ladder against the tree and, you know, you've seen the Old West uh, hanging nooses, the 13 coils and the drop front, which is supposed to break your neck. That's not how they died, unfortunately, in 1692. The executioner and the executed one went up the ladder. Uh, she was, or he was bound, and the, four, the, the term is they were turned off, which meant the executioner uh, would take their legs and turn them off the ladder, and then they would swing, and after a period of time, they would strangle to death. Mm -hmm. And the next one, they would just move the ladder and do it. Much more efficient, uh, much more in keeping with the historic record. Mm -hmm. um, they refer to the gallows on a few uh, different uh, um, uh, documents, uh, and I think that's how it was done. That's mm -hmm. the way Puritans, I believe, would have done it. Clearly, there are a lot of hobbyist historians who they find a historical 
moment in time that they are passionate about. And a lot of people, it, it's Salem for them. But you, you've shown that this is this is your career, right? You know, you talk about memories of childhood being in your grandmother's library, mm-hmm. reading old books, but then grad school, and and here you are today. You know, this has been your life. And so, at the end of the day, if there's if there's one thing you hope people can take away from this moment in time, what is it? Uh, to me, the witchcraft really boils down to um, two lessons. And back in 1992, we had the 300th anniversary. And for over a year, uh, all of the communities around us uh, were doing major programs and projects and so forth. And um, I thought that this should be a real commemoration and, weird word, a celebration. Um To me, there are two major things that came out of uh, the witchcraft. One is the thing we have here at Banty every day now. The president of the United States is always talking about uh, being involved in a witch hunt. Uh, That term has been used for a hundred more years about uh, when uh, you take uh, little scanned evidence and a whole bunch of people who are frightened by some things and create a, a witch hunt. Um, and it stems back to 1692. 1692 was a witch hunt. And what it was was a period in which normal, sensible, reasonable people, because of certain fears, frustrations, and uh, a culture that was undergoing certain crises, start acting irrationally. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the Salem witchcraft is a good example of being picked up and used, and we we did this with our memorial. We actually uh, uh, say it uh, on a couple of signages there. Um, you have to confront your own period of witch hunts with clear vision and bravery uh, because this is not something that happened back in 1692. It's almost always with us. From mm-hmm. the internment of um, the uh, Japanese Americans uh, in concentration camps, uh, to the Army McCarthy hearings, the Red Scare, to uh, a time and time again, these kinds of things happen. Uh, even in our own times, mm-hmm. most of us experienced back in the 1980s the horrendous uh, legal procedures against um, uh, nursery school teachers who were accused of doing sexually deviant things, including killing children and killing animals uh, in nursery uh, uh, schools, um, which turned out really not to be the case. And there are still people in this country who are in prison because of it. And the evidence that has come out afterwards shows that it was a period in which people were, because of fears and so forth, they were seeing boogeymen and Mm -hmm. they were seeing things that not a shred of real evidence existed. Uh, And by our mistaking things that we should understand go bad. And if you bring it back to the, the period itself, 1692, uh, in Danvers, we used to not like to talk about witchcraft. It was a scourge on our town and was something that if people want to go and see the witchcraft, send them to Salem. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, let them, let them see the, the tourism in Salem. But we don't want to talk about it. When I was growing up, that was the case. Mm. Uh, you didn't talk about witchcraft uh, in polite society. As a matter of fact, when I started doing the excavation of the Paris house site, 1970, I can remember early on, uh, we would try to bring school groups up and give them a little talk about the excavation we were doing and stuff. And there was a um, uh, two sisters across the street, elderly women, who uh, I can remember on one occasion when I was bringing a group up, uh, they came out on the porch and they actually shook their fist at me and said, <laughs> why are you bringing this up? This is not something we should be talking about. Um It changed a bit after we did the excavation and so forth. And my take on it is that, yeah, it was a terrible time. The civil authorities failed the population. The religious uh, uh, people failed the situation. Um, uh, 
families even urged people in their own family to confess because they must be witches. Uh, every institution failed. But what you do have is really a shining example of average people, some of them really kind of bastards, and some of them nice uh, religious people who, when confronted with the worst crisis in their life, uh, you know, that you're a witch, that you're going to go to hell, that uh, you're, you're trying to destroy us, instead of confessing like 50 people did to at least stay execution, and luckily for them, things worked out because the witchcraft was over and people started realizing their mistakes so that none of those confessors ever were executed. But the 19 who were executed by hanging uh, don't share much in common except that they believed in truth being much more important than life itself. They would not belie themselves mm -hmm. uh, for s survival. And I think that's remarkable. Mm -hmm especially with, you know, uh, fairly uneducated, hardworking people who uh, always tried to do what they were supposed to do. And then when told by authority, you must confess, said no. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, George uh, Jacobs, uh, when confronted with this, said, um, I'll stand in the truth of Christ. I know nothing of witchcraft. And you do get these heroic words from these average people. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's so important. We in history talk about the famous and the infamous and the battles and whatever. But here the personal crisis occurred, and these people would not bend to anything. And uh, because of it, we probably know more Mm -hmm. about the pilgrims who went on the Mayflower, average people, and the witches in 1692 than anybody else who was just a common person who lived 400 years ago. And um, the monument we have in Danvers um, tries to kind of show that uh, in that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the shackles of the past, the chains that uh, once were uh, around their feet and arms being broken by uh, the book of life, history, which eventually will tell the truth of what happens. And here people who were universally condemned in 1692 now become more heroic than they actually were, but still people whose um, beliefs really should be emulated. Richard, thank you so much for talking with me. Okay. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. This episode of Unobscured was executive produced by me, Matt Frederick, and Alex Williams, with music by Chad Lawson and audio engineering by Alex Williams. The Unobscured website has everything you need to get the most out of the podcast. There is a resource library of maps, charts, and links to Salem document archives online, as well as a suggested reading list and a page with all of our historian biographies. And as always, thanks for supporting this show. If you love it, head over to applepodcasts.com slash unobscured and leave a written review and a star rating. It makes a huge difference for the show's growth. And as always, thanks for listening.